This is Reza Aslan for Aslan Media. In the first of our video chats with authors and important people doing important things, and I am so grateful that my very, very good friend Eliza Griswold has decided to join us. Hi, Eliza. Hi, Reza. Eliza is joining us from New York. Eliza is a poet and a journalist and an intrepid world traveler. And her newest book that's just coming out this week is called The Tenth Parallel from FSG. This is a book that she's been working on for, I think, five or six or seven years. What Eliza has done is she's traveled the so-called Tenth Parallel. That's this latitudinal line that's uh, about 700 miles north of the equator. And along this line, you see more than half the world's uh, Muslims and about 60% or so of the world's Christians living sometimes in conflict, sometimes in harmony, but it's a real sort of eye-opener about not just the global changes taking place in these two massive uh, world religions, but also some of the parallels that one sees between the conflicts taking place there and the conflicts being uh, taking place in some of the more developed parts of the world. So, Eliza, let's start real quick by just giving us an idea about how this idea, how this book came about. What, what made you decide to, to write this book? What, what were the experiences that led to you realizing the importance of this 10th parallel line? Well, the book came out of a trip that I took uh, with Franklin Graham, who was at the time George Bush's personal pastor and son of Billy. A real uh, fan of Aslan Media. Media, Franklin Graham. <laughs> so... Franklin was going for the first time to meet with a man he considers the devil, um, which is, that is President Bashir, um, Sudan's president, who now stands uh, indicted for crimes against humanity by the International um, Criminal Court. So Franklin was going to meet with this man who is behind the deaths of an estimated two billion, two, excuse me, two million people in Sudan, uh, declared the world's, modern world's largest jihad. Uh, and he was going to meet with this guy because he wanted, in part, to convince him to let him proselytize, to let him preach to Muslims in northern Sudan. Wow. And, and <laughs> why, why would Bashir want to meet with Franklin Graham? I mean, Franklin Graham has gone on... on uh, I mean, yes, of course, in this case, he may be right. Bashir may very well be the devil. But uh, Franklin Graham thinks that pretty much all Muslims are of the devil. He's called it's Islam an evil cult. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, why would Bashir want to meet with him? Well, Bashir wanted to meet with him at that time, in 2003, because he was terrified that Sudan, after Iraq and Afghanistan, was going to become the third rogue Muslim regime to be bombed by the U.S. Uh -huh. And so it was in his interest to curry favor with the U.S., and Franklin being close to the administration was a very effective way to do that. In fact, while we sat in the presidential palace in this marble waiting room, and the two men went back and forth, um, each attempting to convert the other to their respective faith, finally, many of us, besides Graham and his closest aide, we were ushered out into this really hot driveway. And while we were standing in the driveway, what happened is, um, Graham reached into his blazer pocket, as he told me later, and remembered that he had a W2004, George W. Bush 2004 re-election pin. And he reached into his pocket, pulled out the pin, and handed it to Bashir. And he said to Bashir, Mr. President, I know you'll be talking to my president later on today, and why don't you tell him you're his first voter here in the Sudan? So what that meeting was really about, I and mean, what that moment was certainly about, was for Graham to underline to Bashir that he had the presidency here, and he was a guy, and that faith and foreign policy went hand in hand as far as Sudan and many other places are concerned. Yeah, so faith and politics go hand in hand in the United States. Interesting. Uh, one can say that about most of the countries along the 10th parallel. So. What kinds of similarities do you see, uh, you know, in these countries like the Sudan, like Nigeria, Somalia, uh, even Indonesia, you went all the way to Malaysia, you went to the Philippines, the conflicts and the tensions that you saw there. First, give us a little sense about what, what you saw as far as those conflicts and tensions go, and then maybe give us a little idea about uh, some of the parallels or similarities that you might see between what's going on over there and what's happening here in our own backyard. 
Sure. I mean, what I saw overwhelmingly is that, you know, I went to where the clash of civilizations is supposed to be happening, right? I went to where this is all unfolding, where the world is supposedly breaking apart. And what I found is the clashes within religions are far more important to shaping the future of what's going on than any kind of simplistic clash between them. So overwhelmingly, even in cases where you would see, you know, militants on both sides trying to control the question of who speaks for God, right? They would use the enemy, the other, the Christians would use the Muslims, the Muslims would use the Christian to whip up fervor and whip up following. Um, but really, when you got down to it, they weren't trying so much to pull control away from that so-called enemy. They were trying to get control within their own side. Uh, that's certainly something we see repeatedly here. I mean, I, this whole community center kerfuffle is all about, you know, who's a real Christian, Franklin Graham or Barack Obama, who has the right to speak for God. And certainly with this last weekend with Glenn Beck, you know, his so-called return to God, America coming back to God, is, is exactly that, is saying, guess what, people? I claim the authority of God, and God is one Hell of a conservative. <laughs> yeah, it's anti-Republican. Um, now, here's the really interesting thing that a lot of uh, observers have, have noted is that Islam, as a global religion, tends to be moving northward and westward, whereas Christianity, as a global religion, is moving southward and eastward. Is that true, and what does that actually mean? This is, this is extremely tricky ground, right? Because what you're basically looking at is plotting, plotting demographics on a map, right? So mm -hmm. the, the most effective system by which to do that, that that I'm familiar with right now is something called GIS, Global Information Systems, which basically plots data on satellite images. So then we say, vis-a-vis -vis Christianity, that, that the center of... In 2010, right, the center, and again in 2050, like this, this continues to move, that the center of global Christianity, it demographically thickest point, is going to be right in the heart of Muslim North Africa, right? That's the most, we'll hear that kind of bandied about. What does that actually mean? That's harder to be. I mean, what's certainly happening along the 10th parallel is that with population growth, these two groups of people, uh, they could be any groups of people. These two populations are growing the fastest, and they're turning increasingly to revivalist forms or reawakened forms of religion that tend to pit the other as the absolute enemy. And so conflicts that begin, mm -hmm. this is already, this. so we're looking at a horizontal band. I'm just, lat is flat. That's my latest. <laughs> Latitude is between the equator and the 10th parallel, which is 700 miles to the north. West Africa, Africa, when we look here, we're seeing a band that's incredibly sensitive environmentally also. Um, it, for various reasons of wind and weather, it's something, we'll just throw out the word, but it's not that important. It's the intertropical convergence zone. Here, all kinds of weathers meet. This is why the trade winds have carried Muslim, like Buddhist and mm -hmm. other Chinese traders to the same islands mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. for centuries. This is why this is why we hit the southern edge of dry land in North Africa, the Sahel, and the beginning of sub-Saharan jungle. So all of this underlies this extremely sensitive band of geography. That means that questions of drought, um, flood, catastrophic storms tend to happen here. And so that pits people increasingly against each other with secular causes that do tend to lead to religious mm. conflagration. So, uh, as you know, uh, Eliza Griswold's book, The Tenth Parallel, will be Aslan Media's September book club pick. Um, do you have any last kind of ideas or thoughts or, or what is maybe the, the takeaway that you would like uh, an American audience to get from this book? I definitely like an American audience to get away to get the takeaway that not only is this encounter 1,500 years old, um, most of it begins in Africa in Ethiopia, for example, um, where the Prophet Muhammad sent between a dozen and two dozen of his own followers when he was pursued by his own people. Why? Because he was sending them to to the care of a Christian God. 
somebody who shared this belief in a single faith. So, okay, so the coexistence is that old and that profound in much of the world. And what we really need to take away is not just, not just this idea that why can't everybody get along? Because in a lot of places, these conflicts are visceral daily and very real. But we need to look closer at what this clash really is. It is a competition over who speaks for God inside of religions, not just between mm. them. And until we get that, we're going to misunderstand a lot of the current debate, both along the 10th parallel and here in the U.S. Eliza Griswold, poet, journalist, author of The Tenth Parallel, thanks so much for joining us on Aslan Media. Thank you, Reza.